So good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, this webinar, What the Embryo Has to Say About Togetherness with um, Dr. Yap van der Waal. Um, for those of you just joining us now, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tracy Evans. I am the course director at the Craniosacral Therapy Education Trust. Um, Dr. Yap van der Waal is a leading embryologist and anatomist. After his medical education in 1973, he specialized in functional anatomy and was an associate professor of anatomy and embryology at the University of Maastricht in Holland. He then taught philosophy of science and medical anthropology and developed a passion for human embryology. He teaches at craniosacral therapy, osteopathy and other body-mind institutes around the world and regularly presents his findings at conferences. It gives us at CTET enormous pleasure to host his webinar this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Yap van der Waal. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, usually I should say good evening, everybody, but I don't like that word. But it has to do with the fact that maybe I do not speak English so well, but I don't like the everybody. I do not speak with bodies. I speak with people. I connect with people, with persons. But you say in your language, good evening, every, everyone. Oh, that's more interesting to say hello, everyone, because we now are one. You are an audience and we are connected. We are together. We are one. We are one group. We are one population, we are one mankind. It's interesting for me, the word one. Everybody, then I see millions of bodies. But when I say everyone, there suddenly is something unity, there's something, yeah, something oneness. And maybe that's where I want to talk about tonight, about what the embryo has to tell about wholeness and oneness and being together. But okay. Let me first uh, introduce me. I am indeed an embryologist. I'm an anatomist. I am a phenomenologist, a certain kind of scientist. I will talk about that. And I go all over the world with courses about the embryo. And not the embryo that you maybe are familiar with, the embryo from the books, the embryo of the past, the embryo of the development. No, the embryo in us. Because it's one of my missions to tell the people that actually we are embryo. We do not, we were not embryo, but embryo is something actual in us. There is an embryo in us, which apparently is the primary fundamental thing in our bodies, in our mind. I will tell you about that. So, and there was a course planned for the CTET in March, but then came the coronavirus. And so we had to postpone the course to September. And then Michael, Michael Kern, suggested, well, maybe you can give a small lecture to people who are interested in order to make them maybe enthusiastic for that course in September. So that's the mo most important reason I am here now. Okay, the embryo in us. But first, what is the connection between embryo and virus? Well, there is, there are several connections to think about what, what, has to, what an embryo has to do with the coronavirus. First, the shape, very simple. On the left side, you see here an egg cell, an egg cell, maybe already fertilized, and then we call it a zygote. And a zygote, I will tell you, is not a cell. And then on the right side, you see the coronavirus. And they both have a corona. And that was my first association, corona. I know that from something, I know about coronas. The embryo, the egg cell, the early embryo, has a corona around it, a coat of cells. And these coat of cells take care of the egg, take care of the early embryo. So that was my first association. But corona radiata means more. Corona radiata remembers, reminds me of the, the eclipses that I ever watched, sun eclipse. It's a magic moment when the moon shadow comes in front of the sun, the sun disappears, it becomes dark, there's a black hole on the sky, in the sky, and then suddenly, very subtle, on the outside of that black spot, there comes the corona radiata. 
very weak bluish flaming light that you usually cannot see by day. Then there is the corona radiata. It's a subtle mantle around the egg cell. It's a subtle mantle around the shadow of the moon. How different the corona is of the coronavirus. Because that are weapons and they connect with your receptors and they destruct your cells. So things look alike, but it is quite different what they mean. And that is yeah, a problem that you often see in biology, that when things look alike, it does not mean that they are the same, that they are similar. And that is, let's say, science. Here you see an egg cell, a not yet fertilized egg cell, with around it, you see that corona radiata, a coat of cells the, that is, so to say, take care of the egg. How large is an egg cell? How large is an early embryo? It's huge, but you don't see that when you measure it. This, what I have in my hands here, is a dime, the US dime. And on the dime, there's an image of Roosevelt. And this, here you see the face of Roosevelt. And there's an eye and an early embryo an early embryo is just as large as an egg cell. An early embryo is just as large as that eye of Roosevelt. It's 0.2 millimeter. That is not large. But the egg cell is large. It is the largest cell of the human body. What is largeness and smallness? Large and small are in my phenomenological mind, a phenomenologist is not looking for causes or explanation. He tries to understand shapes and forms. And so large and small is a behavior, is a way of being, it's a gesture. The egg cell is the largest cell of the human body. What makes her so large? Not her measure. When you measure her, she's 0.2 millimeter. Well, that's about 20, 20 times as large as a, as, an, as a normal cell. Is that large? No. But she behaves as large. She makes her cells as large as possible. And she becomes in this way the largest cell of the human body. How large is she? She's so large that you can see her with the naked eye. 0.2 millimeter is the mass, is the, is the, is the diameter of a cent grain. And that's maybe the smallest particle you can see with your naked eye. You see, what is small on the one position is large on the other. So largeness is for me a quality. I could also ask you, what is the smallest cell of the human body? And how large is a virus? A virus is very small. You know how small is a virus? The virus is six to 60 to 140 nanometers. How small is that? It's only small when you compare. When you compare it with an egg, then it's really small. Here, this small black dot, that is the largeness, that is the diameter of a coronavirus. If you compare, then you see what large and small is. Large and small is not a quantity, it's a quality. And the embryo is small. But that's only when you measure, when you quantify things. But when you look at what's happening in the embryo, how it makes itself as large as possible, then there's another quality of largeness. How large is a sperm? A sperm is very small. A sperm, here you see the corona radiata of the egg cell. And there's a zona pellucida, it's a very shining membrane about the egg, around the egg cell. And then you see here and there, there are some sperms. It are the heads of the sperms. Here it's enlarged. There's the head of the sperm and there's the tail. How small is a sperm? Well, if you measure it, you won't see it. Then you can come to, well, the head of a sperm is about four microns. That is half of a normal cell. And the tail is about, uh, well, the tail is about uh, 60 microns. Um, that is quite large. If you are, you know, a mouse of five, 
uh, two, no, five inch, one inch, I don't know in English, but okay. And you have a tail like a sperm cell, and then you have a tail of about one yard. So actually, the sperm cell has largeness, but if you compare it with the egg, it is small. He makes himself as small as possible. How small can you be as, when you are a cell? You make yourself so small and you throw out everything that has to do with cytoplasm. So actually, the sperm cell is a nearly dead cell. He has thrown out everything that has to do with life, with metabolism, the cytoplasm, and that is why I consider the sperm cell as the smallest cell of the human body. What I'm doing here is to demonstrate to you actually what my method is. My scientific method is phenomenology. And phenomenology is not that you are the onlooker, that you observe an object and describe it, but that you participate on the object, that you, so to say, replace yourself in an egg cell and experience how the cell is swelling, swelling, and make herself large, where the sperm is making himself smaller, smaller. And you know, a sperm, doesn't have any communication with the world around it. But an egg is open to the environment. That's why an egg is so vulnerable. So the phenomenologist is not interested in forms as anatomy, but is interested in forms as gestures, qualities. Now look at the virus. One of the discussions that you nowadays also hear is, is the virus alive? Is it a living being? Well, most biologists say, no, it's not a living being. It cannot be a precursor of life because a virus is just a strand of DNA and DNA is a molecule. It's a molecular form of structure. And a virus is nothing than a strand of packed up DNA. It's not alive. A living being can metabolize, can grow, uh, can metamorphosize its body. There is other principles are in living nature. DNA, therefore, has nothing to do with life. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we all think that DNA is the molecule of life. It's not. It has nothing to do with life. It's a molecule, it's a structure. Its DNA is structure, is form. And form has not to do with life. I will tell you what I mean and why that is so important. Because on the lower row, you see here an egg cell, you see here a four day old embryo or three days old embryo. There are more cells, but it's still as large as the egg cell was. And here you see an embryo of seven weeks, seven days old. It is still as large as the egg cell was. But there's an enormous difference between the blastula. This is a blastula, it's one week old. You still see the zona pellucida the shining membrane around it, the same zona pellucida is around the egg cell, and the same zona pellucida is here around the morula. This is the morula, this is the blastula. And you see, they are, have the same size. In the first week, you do not grow. And that is what we first associate with life, growing, expanding, cells, multiplication of cells, more cells becoming large. And actually you see that the first phase of your development is not, has not to do with growing at all. What do I mean with that? Why is that important? Great and small. The virus confronts us with disease, with mortality, the fear for death, is hounding around the planet and everybody stays at home in order not to become contaminated because we fear to die. And what is disease actually? Well, a disease can be caused by a virus and then you have COVID-19 disease. But is that the same? Is the virus the same as the disease or is disease something else? Well, it's very simple. The virus is not the cause of your COVID-19 disease. The virus is a condition for that because the virus on itself can never be ill. I've never seen an ill or a, a, a disordered DNA. I mean, DNA, viruses are structures. They cannot be ill. 
organisms, living beings can be ill. And as soon as a virus enters or is entering a human body, then you see disease, then you get a diseased organisms, organism. And that might be important to understand what, that there are two views on disease. And it was Nietzsche, the philosopher, who made us aware of that. That we usually nowadays tend to only think in terminology of small disease or smaller health, let me say it more correctly. Nietzsche defined two, let's say, stages, two qualities of being healthy, greater health, major health, and minor health, small health. And what has that to do with? That has to do with yeah, what we, how we think about our body. Small health is, let's say, the dominant way we nowadays think about health. Minor health is, so to say, the, um, the definition of health is then related to the body. It's a definition of body. We define normal, then is a normal body is a body where abnormality is absent. A healthy body is a body where pathology is absent. And a living body is a body where death is absent. But that, Nietzsche said, is the smaller definition of health. Then you, so to say, connect health and life and disease and normality with the body. And that's the smaller version of health. Greater health is what you, as a living body, as a living being, do with it. Nowadays, we consider, for example, people that have cancer and they have to fight with it. And if you lose your fight, then you're or the loser. And I had a friend who died on cancer a few months ago. The way the man lived the last few years of his life was an example, was a masterpiece of being a human being because he was not a loser. He was very sound, actually. He was very healthy in the way he lived his cancer. You can die on a cancer, but that does not mean that you are a loser. That is, what, um, that is what Nietzsche wanted to emphasize. Health is not the polarity of disease. We tend to think that life and death are oppositions, that healthy and disease are oppositions, that normal and abnormal are polarities or oppositions. But Nietzsche said, no, health is integration. When you are integrated, then you are healthy. And disease is disintegration. When the system falls apart, when the system you know, no longer can function on the level that it should function. And that's an interesting definition of disease. Because when you get your coronavirus and you get COVID-19, then you will, you will see that everybody will you know, live, everybody will suffer from the disease in a different way, in its own way. Some people are very ill. Some people just overcome it. Other people die on it. And when you die, when you are diseased by the virus, then your healthy body, your healthy being disintegrates, Nietzsche says. And healing is integration. As if wholeness, and in your language, whole, is related to health. Wholeness is the integration status and disease, pathology, death is the disintegration. And then you can come to the conclusion that you can live quite normally and quite healthy and yet be an abnormal or pathological and mortal being. We have forgotten that mortality is a principle, an essential feature of life. It is not life versus death. Death, mortality, is an integrated, essential feature of life. And that is what I learned from the embryo. So here I summarize, here I summarize what Nietzsche had said. Greater health is integration. It's the holistic view on, on being healthy. The primary body, the primary reality is our greater health. When we live integrated with our body, with our environment, with ourselves. And the smaller health 
is disintegration. So when the system is, so to say, falling apart. So smaller health is a definition of health and life uh, connected to the body. But greater health is, connecting to, is connected to we as a living being. Is that a difference? Is the dead body something else than a living body? Of course. But that is also true in our daily life. We have, when we live, when we live our life, when we are together with each other, we have two bodies. We have two body realities. This is a quote of Rumi. And Rumi says, Rumi, that's wisdom from the 13th century. Rumi says, study me as much as you like. You will never know me. For I differ in hundred ways from what you see me to be. Put yourself behind my eyes and see me as I see myself. For I have chosen to dwell in a place you cannot see. What does he mean? He does mean that in each of us, there is something that no one else can see that no one other else can experience, that only you can experience. And one of the manifestations of that is consciousness, awareness. Nowadays, we consider consciousness as an activity, a pro product of the brain. Nowadays, we think that bodies produce consciousness, soul, awareness. But Ruby says, no, in me, there's something that you will never see. You can never experience, you can never feel the body of me as I feel it when I am part of this body. And we all know that. We all know that in us there is something that is not the body and that, so to say, cannot be shared with someone else. And there is where our body thinking, our body, let's say, philosophy of nowadays is coming from. It's from Descartes. And nowadays, we don't like Descartes so much anymore because Descartes, we say, formulated soul and body, that there is a duality, that we are spirit and matter, that we are soul and body. But that's not what he said. He had discovered something else. In principle, the definition of health has to do with that difference. I mean, smaller health is the health of have of our being, our body, our anatomical matter body. But in me, there's something else. And that is linked with the greater health. I will try to understand, I will try to explain what I mean with that. Descartes did not say, I think, therefore I am. He said, cogito ergo sum. And the emphasis should be on that not I think, therefore I am, because he could always also have said, I feel, therefore I am, or I am aware, or I listen, and therefore I am. What Descartes was formulating actually was the, the essence or the quality that every child is asking for. I mean, every child sometimes comes with the question, mommy, where do I come from? That's a normal question. And why is it so normal? The child experiences in itself, and we all can experience that, that there must be in me, some, in me something that is not my body. Otherwise, I could not be aware of my body. That's a simple rule of philosophy. That's a simple basic, um, uh, let's say, statement in philosophy that you can only see, hear, become aware of something if you are separated, if you are separated from it. So that in you, something is aware of that you are thinking, that you are living, that you are breathing. And that is what the child is asking for. Daddy, no, they first ask it most of the time, mother, mother, where do I come from? And that's the same question that Descartes was formulating. What is that in me? He didn't ask where does it come from, but he said, what is it in me? It must be something else than my body. And now so many people start to protest. My students also started to protest when I would say this. But I gave for many years, I gave lectures on the University of Maastricht, not only about anatomy and embryology, but I talked about the philosophy of the body, somato sophie. 
And there I had, of course, a discussion with the students, what is mind, what is body? Is there a difference? Is it a duality? Or is it, is there no soul? Is there no spirit? Is there only body? Is there only matter? And then they always replied with the next sentence. And the next sentence is, if spirit exists, you simply can think it as an idea, as a hypothesis, or as a belief. But you can think, you can suppose, suppose there is spirit. Then you know one thing for sure. Suppose there's mind. Then you know one thing for sure. It must be, it cannot be something else than the complete polarity of your body, of the matter. Otherwise, it doesn't work. When we were body, we could not have awareness of it. But there must be something in it that is opposite to that. And that is what Descartes formulated. He said, there are two realities. He gave it names. He said, there is the ponderal reality. The rest extends our reality. That's the hard matter dimension. That's my body. That's the anatomy that you can dissect, that you can wait, that you can you know, see and, and, and research. But there's something else. And that is what is thinking in me. He did not say, I think, therefore I am. He meant something in me, somewhat in me is thinking, and therefore I exist. And that what is thinking in me is something else. That's res covitans. Well, you could say, well, that is spirit, that is mind, but it must be something else. Nowadays, we don't think that way. Nowadays, we have an organ that produces consciousness. There's an organ that produces illusions that I think that I have a body. No, no, take it serious. That is phenomenologist. Phenomenology is also to take serious not only what you think about the things, but always to take, also to take serious what you experience. And I experience in myself something else than my body. And Descartes called it the imponderable, the imponderable by di dimension, the dimension that is realizing in your body, that is trying to realize something, a body, a biography, and that is an act. And the body, the ponderable dimension here, the, this is the imponderable by dimension. You cannot measure it, you cannot weigh it, it doesn't have weight. It's the n act dimension. It's my realizing reality in me. And this is the realized reality. That's the body, that's the matter, that's the ponderable dimension. And that is important if you want to understand an embryo. Because what kind of body does an embryo have? What kind of body is attacked by a corona, coronavirus? What body is, what body, what kind of body is diseased, is suffering from a disease? This is, a slogan from Andrew Taylor Still. Andrew Taylor Still was, so to say, a post-Cartesian scientist. He was not a mainstream scientist, but he, hold, uh, he, he was inspired by a triune man idea. Triuneness or threefoldness is a principle that you very often see in different philosophies. You can see it in polarity medicine, uh, the anthroposophists talk about spirit and body, but Andrew Taylor still also talked about mind and body. He used the word mind, not in the modern way. We nowadays use it, so to say, as our, yeah, our intelligence, our consciousness. No, he meant it as there must be in me another dimension, spirit, mind. And then he said a slogan, and the slogan you could read often in his books and his publications, man is mind, motion, matter. If there is the two, because the two is the only possibility, either everything is one, either everything is matter, either everything is body, and your consciousness is a product of your brain, or there is something else. And when there is something else, it must be, it cannot be something else than the complete polarity of that. Then it must be something like spirit. And when you have the two, there is inevitable a third a third dimension, and that is my body. That is the body that I am, not the body that I have. The body that I have is my matter body. That's the body of the anatomist. But the body that I live, the body that I am, is another dimension. That is when I live as a spirit, when I live as a soul in that body, 
you get motion, you get an interface. And for Andrew Taylor still, here you see the quote, it was very logical that mind and matter is not two. Well, it is two, of course, but not in the sense Descartes meant it. Descartes meant it to be a duality, a two-ness. But people like uh, Randall Stone, they formulate that spirit and matter has to be one. No spirit without matter. No function without form. No, no. So that is another way to look at the duality. The duality of Descartes had the risk that you can separate it, that you can think it apart. And that is why after Descartes, people said, oh, we have a spirit, oh, we have a soul, and we have a body. Well, then we start to study the body, because that is ponderable, that you can dissect, that you can study, and we neglected the other possibility and started to look for all kinds of phenomena that could be spiritual or could be soul uh, activities. Of course, every activity of your mind, of your soul, of your spirit, also has a matter, a body counterpart. So two might lead to threefoldness. Now, what is it all has to do with the embryo? And what does it all has to do maybe with the coronavirus? The human being, Andrew Taylor still formulated, is mind, motion, and matter. There's an interface, a third dimension in between. And can you study that? Can you uh, make it visible? No, of course you cannot make spirit or mind visible because it's imponderable but you can think it. And when you think it, you might see the phenomena that you can understand as being expressions of that soul. It's very simple. I told you if uh, scientists study organism, study the world, study the planet, uh, nature, bodies, anatomy, but scientists are, so to say, one-eyed. And I mean with that, that I'm a scientist, I know what science is. And I heard many of my colleagues, you know, promoting this view on science that I, after many years, started to disagree with. Because scientists do not produce facts. They produce images. They give us interpretations. They give us um, an interpretation, a theory about how to understand the facts. That is science but they want us to believe that science is something else. They want us to believe that science is gathering data. In the early days, we were not gathering data, we were gathering phenomena. And then we started to gather facts. And nowadays we, we gather data. So we gather data, and then out of studying those data, we have to draw inevitable so-called objective conclusions. That is science. At least that is what most people think and believe that science is. It is not. And who is saying that? Not Jaap van der Waal, the phenomenologist, or Jaap van der Waal, a weird embryologist believing in soul. No, that is Jaap van der Waal, the professor in anatomy, the scientist. That is not science. Science is something else. Science is having something in your mind an idea, a concept, call it an hypothesis, and then looking for the data, the facts that are in harmony with that concept or idea. And then you say, the facts give me right. That's false. Facts never give you right. You interpret them, and if your interpretation is in harmony with the fact, then you say, oh, it's proven that. I am an embryologist. I believe in spirit. So what I do, I go to the embryo and study for the data in the embryo that are in harmony with the fact of that we are beings creating our body. That we are not created by our body, that we are not a product of the body, but that we are ourselves beings that create bodies, that shape bodies. Because that's what your father said. Because first you went to your mother, Mammy, mother, mommy, mommy, where do I come from? And she said, you come from my belly. There's not any child that believes that. Maybe the children that have already got an iPad when they're two years old and they're already, you know, impregnated with all the modern views on what the body is. But 
the original child, the native child, the naive child will ask, but how did I come into your belly, belly mother? Where was I before, in your be before I was in your belly? And then mother says, go to your daddy, he knows. And then they go to daddy, and daddy tells the story of the sperm and the egg. It's an ugly story. If you come to my embryo course, maybe in, in September in, uh, in London, I will tell you that, that fertilization has nothing to do with fertilization. Conception is something else. But what it is, no matter, father says that at the moment of conception, you were made. That is the answer of father to the question of the child. Where is that in me coming from? There is no, no where, where you come from. You were made. We nowadays think that body are made by fertilization, by uh, sperm cells, fertilizing egg cells. But that is when you, and then the fa father goes through it. He says, well, you started as a fertilized egg cell. I will show you very soon, there are no fertilized egg cells. But the father wants to prove you, to tell you that you started as a cell and that the cells started to divide. And then there came more cells, and there came organs, and there was a body, and the body started to walk, and to talk, and to go to school, and to read books, and then it started to write books. Voila, Jaap van der Waal. That is where we come from. We come from the body. We all believe it nowadays. We all believe that the first was the body, and the body comes from a fertilized egg cell, and the body is just a product of cells, the more cells, more cells, and then you have the body as a product, and the body starts then to think, to work, to do, to write by means of the brain. So we are made by the body. The embryo tells you a complete different story. The embryo tells you that the mind cannot be the product of the body, because the mind is something Spirit is something in me working and shaping and organizing. We are not the product of our bodies. We, so to say, produce, make, create, orchestrate our own bodies. And that's quite another view. So again, if you want to study spirit, if you want to see spirit in body, in anatomy, in embryo, first think it. And when you think it, when you think on an NX dimension, that is, uh, trying to appear and to realize itself by means of a body, then you can see it, not with these eyes, not with your Cartesian eyes, because your Cartesian eyes, your retinas, can only see visible, ponderable, you know, exact matter. But with your mind eyes, with your thinking, you can see coherence, you can see phenomena that are, so to say, super sensible. But super sensible does not mean that it's not reality. I will show you what I mean. But my advice is, if you want to see spirit, if you want to study soul, if you want to study mind, first think it. And when you think it, you can start to see it by means of organizing the phenomena in such a way that they are in harmony with spirit. But that's a complete different view on what your body is. That also gives a complete different view on what is disease. That goes in the direction of Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, smaller health is the health related to the body. Is it normal? Is it not pathological? Is it non-mortal? But the greater uh, health is related to the body that we are, the body that is personal, the body that is unique. Here you see again a quote of Rumi. And Rumi says, the body comes from us. And as an example, he takes the wine. He says, wine got drunk with us. Well, he must be mad at Rumi. Maybe he was drunk when he said it. Well, it's a way to think it. That when we drink a glass of wine, that the grapes find their fulfillment. That's where they were meant for, to make people drunk. That's maybe where the coronavirus is meant for, to have us experience the COVID-19 disease. Well, Maybe you're laughing there on the other side of the screen because I cannot see you, I cannot hear you, but I hope you are willing to go in that fantasy that it's opposite, that wine got drunk with us, not the other way, that the body developed out of us, not we from it. We are bees 
honey, uh, Rumi says, we are bees and our body is a honeycomb. We made the body. Cell by cell, we made it. Can you see that? Yes, you can see that. It, I started as a naturalist. I was a good anatomist and I still am a good anatomist. I know what anatomy is. I write articles about the anatomy of the locomotor system. I write articles about the fascia. I'm an anatomist, I'm a scientist. But I also became embryologist. First, it were two separate domains. That is how it nowadays organized. The embryology department is a different department than the anatomy department. But in those early days, you had a department of anatomy and embryology. But it were two different disciplines. And then later on, I could unite them. And also in university science and in the university hierarchy, there came a principle called morphology. And morphology is something else than anatomy. It has to do with forms, but anatomy is about how does it look like? The anatomist describes the forms, the structures of the organs and the tissues and the body. But the morphologist asks the question, how come? How come? that the forms look like as they look like. What they try to understand the form. And the best way to understand what a form is, is going to the embryo. Because there you see that the forms, the anatomy is shaped. And that is the lesson I learned from the embryo. In living nature, form, matter is not the primary. In living nature, in every living being, form, is so to say, form is so to say, shaped or the result of a motion. That every living organism is in principle a motion, a process. And in the process, it ends with the form. Anatomy comes out of the motion, comes out of the embryo. The primary is the embryo. The secondary thing is anatomy. Actually, that is the process of shaping. Embryos are shaping their bodies, and the result are the forms. Your skeleton is a result, not a beginning. And every anatomist started with it. How come? Anatomists were scientists, were modern people, and they started to dissect, to analyze the body. And they dissected the body in parts, in discrete structures, in muscles and ligaments and organs. And that's OK. Of course, if you analyze, if you take an organism in its parts apart, then you have parts in your hand. But then the anatomist start to teach his students. I had to teach it also for 35 years on the University of Maastricht. I had to teach my students to tell them that the body was built up from those parts. And that's how we work. That's how we think. That's why we can make machines that look like humans and that can function like humans, that can function like animal beings or whatever. Because we think that an organism, a body, is composed from, is constituted by, is built up from the parts. But that's not what they saw. That's not a fact. That is not an observation. That's an interpretation. And the embryo tells you something else about parts and whole about body and elements. The embryo tells you, tells you that the forms, the elements, the organs, the parts come out of the whole. And that the primary process in a body is not form, is not anatomy, but a motion, a process. And out of that motion, for example, comes a skeleton. So you end up as a skeleton. You do not start with it. That is phenomenology. Phenomenology is not only take for true what you can see, think, observe, but also take for true what you experience. Because when I look at an embryo, not as an observer, not as an onlooker, but I, so to say, replace myself in an embryo, then I see something else. I will show you what I see when I deal with embryos. There comes a movie, I hope it works. There comes a movie and it's one of the first time I do is a webinar. I've never done a webinar before. So I hope it all works. And I will start a movie now. You see a black screen and there's an embryo. Pardon, pardon me, sorry. Here, there is an embryo. No, yep, easy. Okay, yep. Here, there's an embryo. No, yep. 
sorry. I need to make my, there it is. Here is the embryo in the center. It's very small. It's four weeks old. You can hardly see it's an embryo as a, as a layman or a laywoman. I don't know how you say that in English, lay. Okay, but now I will start a movie and then you will see something else. But to start a movie, I have to get rid of my laser pointer. Yes, there we go. This is artificial. It is a morphing. Morphing is a modern computer technique with which you can show something that you cannot see normally. Because what do we normally think when we talk about embryo? We think in phases, stages, stage week one, week two, three, three. and we think in stages after each other. The stage of the fourth week comes after the stage of the third week and so on. But morphing is a technique in which you can, so to say, bring different stages that come after each other, connect with them, so to say, you shoo the images together, and then you see emotion. This is an artificial movie, and it's created by, by, by sticking, so to say, by shooing several stages of a human embryo together, and then you see that it is emotion, it's a process. You see here, the body is a motion, a movement, a gestaltung, they say in German, a shaping. It's a process, it's a motion. You start as a motion. And as long as you're embryonic life, you are involved in this, in shaping, in moving, in processing your body. And you think, I hope, I think, that you end with it when you're an embryo. And that is not. This never ends. Your body also now, right at this very moment, is primarily a process, a motion. But gradually, some of the motions of the tissues and the cells come to rest. And then you see forms, anatomy come out. Actually, you could say that your whole life long, you are embryonic. You're still shaping your body. Also, your so-called adult body is not ready. You, cannot, you never become ready. There's always this processing. Every morning you wake up with another body. Every morning you wake up with a million new synapses in your brain. Don't let your Windows computer do that. Your Windows computer, yes, that's anatomy. That is form. That is shape. But my brain might function as a computer, but it is not a computer. It's a computer that is permanently shaped. It is in process. That is why my brain computer is so flexible and can change every night and adapt new synapses and network, whatever. So that is the primary principle of my body. The primary principle of my body is not anatomy. The primary principle of a body is process. And where does that come from? What is moving there? What is causing, if you want to know, what is causing this? Oh yeah, that comes from the cells. The cells are dividing and the cells produce the body. No, no, no. How come that I'm so convinced of that? So let's stop with the movie, follow it one time. You see that the embryo makes motions. It is lifting its head, it's raising its head. It is extending the arms. It shapes arms and legs. If I could tell you, and I can tell you that if you come to the course in September, I should do with you movement exercises in which you follow the same shaping of the embryo. And when you make the shape, the, the gesture with which, with which your arms are shaped, you will see that your arms are first, you know, flexed. And then they close. And then they rest upon the heart. And then you see that an arm is extending and it opens and the embryo stretches its arm. But not as I do it now. I now have a body that I can move with. But in the beginning, my body was a motion itself. And the way I shape and create my arms is, so to say, shaping in morphology what I later on can do in physiology. I don't believe we have locomotion. It is not locomotion, it's posturing. When I move my body, when I move my so-called musculoskeletal system, it's not a motion. It's a shaping. It's a very rapid changing of gestalt, of shape. That is why I can do that consciously. But I can, 
maybe come, I come back to that later. So let's skip the movie and go back to the slides. You know, a body is behavior. A body is not a passive anatomical machine-like st structure. A body is a process, it's behavior. The difference between a lion and an embryo is not only the mind of the two animals or the behavior of the, no, the first difference is their bodies because rabbits have bodies that are perfectly fitted to be rabbit and lions have bodies that are perfectly fitted to be lions. They have different bodies and therefore they have different souls, they have different psychology, different behavior. Your body is a behavior. So what does that mean? That the embryo is a phase that never ends. We think that we have a body and that we function with it. But Andrew Taylor still said, no, form and function are one. And the embryo lives it. The embryo shows you that the first functioning of your body is your growing, your gesturing, your shaping. The embryo functions in forms. And then you see a word there in the slide, and that is the word still. That's not Andrew Taylor still, but that's a mistake. Because when you say the embryo functions in forms, it's okay. But when you say it still functions in forms, then you try to indicate that it's not only reserved for the embryonic phase that you are shaping, it is a lifelong process. And these gestures with which you shape your body are the movements and actions of the embryo. So in a way, your body is a performance. And the result of the performance, the result of the acting, the result of the behavior, that is form. So my body is formed by, is the product of, and not the reverse. So what does that mean? That every organ, although it might function as a computer, although it might function as a, as a, as a, you know, a piece of glass like your lens and your cornea, it is not a piece of glass. It is not a computer. It's not a pump. It functions as a pump. And that is something else. I will try to explain that. Here you see the embryo eye. And the embryo has an eyelid and there comes a lens. And you see a black spot, and the black spot is your retina. And we all can see, we can see this in embryo because your eyeball is still transparent. In the beginning, the eyeball is connective tissue, and it's very subtle connective tissue, it's watery, and you can look through it. But then later on, it becomes collagenous connective tissue. And collagenous connective tissue is not very transparent. You can see it, your eyeball is the same stiff and thick tissue of which your tendons, your epidurosis, your fasciae are built from. It is stiff, regular, dense connective tissue. And now your cornea. Your cornea is also collagenous connective tissue. But then from the 10th week on, you start to produce their certain globulins. They're very special. We call them alpha and gamma crystallins. And then they transform the connective tissue of your cornea and the cornea becomes transparent. And then you can use it as an instrument to look through. But that's a process and you have to perform that process a life long. If you stop with that, you get cataract. Then you have pathology and then your cornea becomes less transparent and at the end you cannot look through it anymore. So what is the transparency? The transparency of the lens, the transparency of my cornea is not a matter, is not a property of the material. It's an activity. That's the difference between a heart and a pump. A pump is a machine that is constructed in such an anatomical way that it can pump. But the heart is something else. The heart is an organ that can function as a pump. But it also has to do other things. It also has to develop its shape con during your whole life and has the depth constantly to new situations. You know, so organs are processes. Blood is not a fluid. Blood is a tissue. And this morning I gave a webinar about fascia. Blood is a fascia. Blood is a dynamic connective tissue. And, but it functions as a fluid. And to function as a fluid, you need vessels. And that is why blood is the first organ, the first tissue you make in your embryonic body, because as a fluid, it can connect to things. It can 
communicate between the organs and the other fields that come up in an embryo. So blood is a tissue, it's not a fluid, it's a fluid, it's a tissue that can function as a fluid. And that is what I learned from the embryo, that the body is not a form that functions, the body, the anatomy itself is function. And that was exactly what Andrew Taylor still also mentioned. The speech of the embryo is the speech of the forms, and you can understand that language. It tells you how, what the forms are meant for, what they mean, what they're processing. And don't think ever again that the embryo is a not yet being. Because nowadays we think that embryos are not yet. Because embryos are primitive. They cannot walk. They cannot write a book. Have you ever seen a person showing you a picture of himself or herself, three years old, playing with sand, in the kindergarten and she or he showed you that picture that that image and said to you well look this is not me yet have you ever met a person who said that i don't hope so because most of the time they say well this was me three years old or this is me three years old but we point at an embryo and then we say well that's not human yet and some people say it looks like an animal it, yeah, it might look like an animal, but it's not an animal. Again, you see what you think is what you see. Because when I show these images that you now see on the screen to my students, you see an embryo of four weeks old, five weeks old, six weeks, eight, and eight weeks old. They say, well, sir, look, what? It looks like an animal. They know that I have my comment on Darwin, and you always had debate about Darwinism. And they said, well, look, sir, you can see that the embryo looks like an animal here. There are tails, there are fins, there are gills. And then he had to correct them. Why? We are working on a university. I teach medical students and I want them to become academic people, sci scientists. So I had to correct them. And I said, well, when you say that it looks like an embryo, that is not an observation. That's not a fact. That's an interpretation. You see homology. Homology is looking alike. The virus looked like a corona embryo. But things that look alike, then the question behind that is, the methodological question behind, who resembles whom? Because when you say that an embryo of about a few weeks old looks like an animal, that is one of the two interpretations you can take. Because the other interpretation could be that Humans do not look like, like animals, but that animals look like human embryos. Why not? The facts do not tell you that. Who is constantly looking in your mind? Who is also in your brain present? Mr. Darwin. And Mr. Darwin had, has taught us how to look at the animal kingdom. And that is why we, when we see an embryo, and we see tails, and we see fins, and we see gills, that we think, oh, it looks like an animal. But there are no tails, there are not fins, there are not gills. There are transient stages in an embryo you have to go through in order to shape later your mandible and your cranium. That are the so-called gills. And that tail is not a gill, uh, that, that tail is not a tail, that tail is your sacral bone. So you interpret something. Homology is inevitable. Homology is a fact. But who resembles whom? That is science. That is the theory that is the interpretation and if you interpret this as coming from the animals okay then you say humans look like animals but the other possibility is also there what does that mean if i would ask you do frogs from come from tadpoles i'm sure that 90 80 percent of you would say yes of course frogs come from a tadpole why well first is the tadpole and then comes the frog so the frog comes out of the tadpole. Now you're in the midst of a very important scientific dilemma. A dilemma that we very often, you know, neglect and forget in science. There are two phenomena and they happen, they happen in a related way. Association, we call that. When you hear me talk, that is associated with brain activity. Okay, that's a fact. When I'm now talking to you, when I'm moving my arms, something happens in my brains and you can make the visible with a scan. But post or 
propter. Post means post, as the word post. One phenomenon comes after the other. But does that mean that phenomenon B that comes after phenomenon A, that A is the cause of B? No, that is not necessarily. B, you can say, the tadpole is also a frog. That is how the frog has to look like when it was a tadpole stadium stage. So the frog is already present here. This is how a frog looks like of about two hour, uh, about a few weeks old. So the frog does not come out of the tadpole. The tadpole also is frog. And it's very logical that a frog, that a frog of about eight weeks old has to look like a tadpole because it still has to swim in the water. And that is with an embryo. An embryo is not a not yet being. An embryo is a complete organism. Everything fits. Form, function, environment. It is a very complex organism. And we say it's not yet. And that is what I want to change. I want to, you to realize that the embryo is not past, that you are not caused by your embryonic body, but that you still are embryo. That actually the adult is not the end. The adult is, so to say, the way you are now human being. And the way you were human being when you were eight or five weeks old was the, were, were the stages that I showed you. So what do we always forget when we talk about human life, when we talk about life? We forget time. Living organisms are not just anatomy, are not just structures. Living organisms have a time life, a time body. They live in time. And that's, let me now answer the question that the child is asking to the father, for the, to the father. Because the father said, well, you do not come from somewhere else. You were made and you know when? Well, at conception. At conception, something started. There was an egg and a sperm, and the egg was from your mother, and the sperm was from your father, and then they come together, and that's conception, that is fertilization. Beware, beware. It has nothing to do with fertilization. It's a pollination, but okay. They come together, and then you start. And then comes cell division and growth and organs and the body. And then, so what father tells his child is this. That what, he, what, what you're now looking at, what you're now listening to, Jaap van der Wall, is the product, is the consequence of the concept, conception that was the moment that Jaap was made. And what I'm doing here is just a product of my body, and the body was the result of growing, the result of embryonic development. That is what father told you. But children don't believe it, let's say the innocent children, not yet spoiled by teaching, but not yet spoiled by the iPad, but still the original child does not believe that. Why not? If they are lucky, the children, they are confronted with a deathbed. But nowadays, that's not so common anymore to have children standing beside the bed of their dying granddaddy. My children did. They were there and they saw it happen. And children are not afraid of death. They are curious. And when it happened, when my father died, what is the first question phenomenologist children, because children are still phenomenologists, chil children, children has not yet learned to think about the things. They experience the world. They live in the primary reality. What is the primary reality? That's the reality you all live in by day. That is the world of senses. That is how you experience, see, and live the world. So the children have a very logical question. Where is granddaddy? Yes. Now, and the answer of most fathers is, well, there is no granddaddy anymore. You can see that. Of course they can see that. That granddaddy no longer is present there in the body. But they see something disappear. We see something end. And of course we are right. When you die, it's the end of Jaap van der Waal. No more Jaap van der Waal. When he's dead, it's over. But the children apparently see something disappear. And they also are right. Because what do they see disappear? That what you cannot see. They see soul, spirit, the imponal dimension that shaped that body, that realized that body. That's what they see disappear. So do not debate on the edge of a deathbed who is right. The facts never tell you who is right. There are two interpretations. And what are the facts? The facts are, look at the slide, 
that a living body is transformed, uh, it's, a, it's an irreversible metamorphosis in a corpse. We all know the difference between a corpse and a living body. We all should know the difference between an anatomical corpse, cadaver, and a living body. You can see it here. It's a dramatic, irreversible metamorphosis. And now, and when you come to the cause, I will talk about it. Now we go to the conception, the fertilization. There's also a very dramatic process taking place, also a very dramatic, irreversible metamorphosis. What happens? An egg cell is where it starts with. And the egg cell is fertilized, pollinated. Let's keep that for, the, for a moment, by a sperm, we say, or by something else. At least what happens is that an egg cell is transformed irreversibly in a zygote. And a zygote is not a cell. A zygote is a body, is an organism, a unicellular human organism. We start not, do not start as a cell, we start as a unicellular organism. That is quite normal. All life on this planet started in the unicellular way. Life did not start with cells. Cells are produced by bodies. And the first body that you can see in living nature is the unicellular body. There are primitive forms, of course, and there are transitional stages of life. But that is the principle. A zygote is an organism, a unicellular organism. So what do, what, what can we see here? Well, the beginning of. Or could we see that something connects? While at the deathbed, something left, something left the body. What left the body? Well, the res covitans, the soul, the mind, the imponderable matter. That left the body, apparently, because there's only an anatomical cadaver. So at conception, it might be that something incarnates, connects. What? Well, that's the problem. You cannot. At the deathbed, you can say who is leaving its body. Granddaddy leaves his body. But at conception, you have a question mark. That's why mothers have children on their arm and they, you know, the, 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 the visitors have gone and then they, they have the child on their arms and then they start to dream of that child. You may hope that your mother dreamt of you. What will it be? Will it be driven dead by a drunken uh, car driver when it's 21 years old? Or have I the new Albert Einstein on my arms? You don't know what you have on your arms. You have to wait. Wait for what? For the appearance, not that what will emerge through, not from that body, but through that body. We are not the product of our bodies. Look, this is what Father told you. But this is how it could be, that we are appearances, that we are emerging through our body, something is realized, and then you are at Descartes. Then you are not at Descartes, the dualist that separated the n-act imponderable realizing reality from the realized ponderable extensa matter, the realized reality. No, it is connected, it is one. Through this body, something is speaking, not my brain. It's not my brain or the speak. I speak with my brain. It's me and my body. It's me and my brain. It's not the brain and the body. That is, that is bloody modern philosophy that people think that the situation is as follows. I'm looking at my watch. Okay, I have time. <laughs> that people say, listen to a modern neurophysiologist from Holland, Professor Schwab. And Professor Schwab says it's very simple. The body has only three purposes. The body serves three functions. The body serves the nutrition, the locomotion, and the reproduction of the brain. Are you still with me? So for a person like Schwab, the body starts somewhere here. So this is brain. And this apparently is not the brain. This is the body. So the brain apparently is not body. But next they start to study it as a body. You know, they study anatomy of the brain, they study the function of the brain, and they look for the matter and all the, the scans. But no, no, the body only serves the nutrition, the locomotion, and the reproduction of that brain. So we are 
instruments, you know, we help to move this brain over this planet. We help this brain to reproduce itself. It's the same principle nowadays people think about our genome, that we are walking genomes, that we, our body is a vector for our genome. It's actually the genome that is developing and evolving. And the body is only an instrument for the genome to realize itself. I don't want that. I don't like that and I don't feel that. So the difference is, do you see in an embryo there the production of a body or do you see there the appearance, the shaping of a body? Let me show you what happens in the first week when you are an embryo. Okay, here. These are the first three days of your life. As I already told you, you do not grow. That's we often, what we often associate with grow. Growing is larger. No, growing is not larging, enlarging, more of the same. That is cell. That is what cells do. Cells do not divide. Mitosis is the wrong word. There's only one type of cell that divides. That are the sex cells, the gametes. They have to divide into half cells because they have to reduce their number of chromosomes. But mitosis, the, the fundamental property of cells is multiplication, reproduction, repeating, more of the same, another cell. That is what cells do. Cloning, repeating, reproduction, multiplication, multiply. Bodies are divided by cells. You can see it happen in the first week. There we go. This is not a cell. This is a zygote. And a zygote is different from an egg cell because an egg cell is a cell. What is a cell? A cell is a particle. A cell is a little particle of an organism. Every organism is organized in cells. So the egg cell comes from the mother body and is a part of that, a particle of that. But this is not a particle. This is a body. The zygote is a body, a unicellular body. And don't be negative about it. Have you ever seen a unicellular organism? When in evolution there comes the first primitive living organism, it's a giant step in evolution. We come from the material phase, from the mineral phase, from the dead nature. Suddenly, nobody knows actually exactly how, you see living cells, uh, living one cellular organisms appear. So the zygote is a very simple, but very also complicated living being. Have you ever seen a unicellular being? Well, you can, you can write a whole thick book about it. What that, what that so-called, let's say a paramecium, that's a very simple unicellular organism. What is it doing? With a unicellular body, it has to breathe. It has to digest. It has to defend itself with its immune system, so to say, against the alien world around. It can perceive, it can react, it can move. It can do everything that you are now doing with that so-called complicated body that is maybe sitting behind the screen. So the zygote is a body. And then what happens? Well, the whole first week is not so very impressive. The whole first week, look at the bottom of the slide. You see that the whole first week you do not grow. But after three days, you have become multicellular. And the morula is not a clot of cells. Maybe that ever has happened in evolution. That in the beginning, there were the unicellular living creatures. And then they made colonies, they came together and they made groups. And then you get to multicellular living beings. But, be, but take care, embryology is not a rehearsal of an evolution. Embryonic development has to do with evolutionary development, but it's something else. Maybe in the, fa in the, in the past, cells came together and, and constructed multicellular bodies. Then the multicellular organism were, so to say, colonies or gatherings of cells, but that's not happening here. Here you see that the undivided body of the zygote is subdivided by cells in two cells, a two cellular body, a four cellular body, eight, 16, 35, 32, 64, until 64, we are a compact body, suborganized in cells. And that is how it works. 
That is how your body is developing. You start with the whole. You start with the organism. You start with the body. And the body is sub-organized in cells. Why? To differentiate. To create different cells. Specialized cells. Tissues specialized in digestion. Tissues specialized in perception. Cells specialized in, in, in immunity. So that is what happens. We see that the whole is sub-organized in parts, in organs. The parts come from the whole. The organs do not come. The anatomist dissected the body and found the organs. And then he said that the, the, the whole, the body, is built up from these organs. You see here, that's not how it works. You see that the embryo tells you loud and clear that the organism is the unit of life, not the cell. The cell is a very important uh, vehicle and a very important principle of life. All living beings are, so to say, organized in cells, but it's an organizational principle. It's not the unit of life. It's not a brick stone. Like your organs are not building stones, sorry, building stones. Your organs are not building stones with which you can constitute a body. You three germ layers, I talk about that in my course in September, you are not built up from three germ layers. It is not that your body is the product of three different germ layers, germ tissues. No, the building stone principle is not regarding the cells and the organs that are not building stones. It are organizational fields, principles. That is what happens. So not the particle is the essential unit of life. The particle is the essential unit of the matter, the dead matter. That is what the physicists are doing in, G in Geneva. You know, building a huge instrument, a huge laboratory to find all these particles and the particles in the particles and the electrons and the bosons in the, in the electrons and so on and so on. That is matter. Matter is particle. If you take a piece of iron and you break it in two, you have two pieces of iron. And you have four pieces, eight pieces, and it remains iron till the last, the last bloody molecule. That is particle life. In the organism, in the first primitive organism, that is no longer possible. You cannot divide an organism into half organisms. There are no Jaap van der Waal molecules. The DNA is not the molecule of life. You cannot subdivide living organisms in halves or fourths or quarters or whatever. No, that is the principle of life, is the organism, is the whole. And that's why it's called organism. Look at this. And again, it is not the cells that divide. Cells are matter. Cells, so to say, is the physical component of my body. That is why cells behave like matter. That is like why cells grow like that matter. A crystal can grow. Another crystal. Another crystal. Another molecule. But living beings grow in a different way. They do not grow by adding another particle, another particle. No, they grow by differentiation. And differentiation is what you see here. Here in that morula, three days old, you see that all the cells are genetically the same. Yeah, genetically. But they are already in different fields. You see in the embryo fields coming up. Different metabolic circumstances. The cells on the outside are in a different environment than the cell on the inside. And then they start to differentiate. And guess what happens? At the end of the first week, you still did not grow. I made the blastula stage a little bit larger than the morula stage, but that's actually not correct. All the first week, you do not grow at all. But then at the end of the first week, you see a cavity, a body cavity coming up. A cavity where cells die, and there comes a cavity, no longer a compact body. And now you have already 120 smaller cells. It shows you how large an egg cell is. An egg cell is huge. It can be sub-organized in 120 smaller cells. And then these 120 cells, smaller cells still create a ball, a sphere. Still you have the sphere shape of the egg cell. Still you have the sphere shape of the zygote. Still you have the sphere shape of the morula. But inside there come two fields, a center and a periphery. And from now on, these cells will start to behave differently. And then you get two different tissues. Then you get an embryoblast. 
And embryoblast are the stem cells, the cells that, no, stem cells that cannot make a whole body. Stem cells are not omnipotent. They cannot do anything, but they have the possibility, the potency of becoming everything. The, the embryoblast cells still can differentiate in all kinds of tissues and organs. But these cells are now restricted in their possibility. They will become your placenta. That is differentiation. Out of the one, there comes the two. And the two is only a two because it's different. And there are fields, and it has nothing to do with the genes. Nowadays, they want us to believe that the genes are organizing your body. It's not. Your organism, the organism is organizing your genes. Guess what happens? You see now <coughs> a few center cells and a lot of code cells. This is, so to say, what the corona radiata was before the conception, you now create yourself a coat, a mantle. And that will be your future membrane, your future placenta. It's, so to say, the coat, the mantle in which you can develop for nine months long. And in the center, there is this embryoblast. And that will become, that will develop to the body that's now sitting in the chair and talking to you. So out of the one, there comes the two. And then we see that if you do an experiment, then you can take one embryoblast cell and you can bring it to the trophoblast. You bring it in another field, the embryologists say. Embryologists are the guys and the women of the morphogenetic fields. The differences in the embryo are first morphogenetic, form shaping. It are metabolic differences. The cells in the center come in another metabolic environment than the cells in the periphery, and they adapt to the other circumstances. And you can so therefore take an embryoblast cell, I point out in the slide, and bring it to the trophoblast. And then it will transform in a trophoblast cell. You can also take a trophoblast cell and bring it in the center. Then it comes in another field and starts to adapt and becomes a center cell. But if you try to do the experiment two days later, it doesn't work anymore. And that's the DNA. That is the genes then the genes are organized in a different way. And who is organizing the differences? The genes in your finger are not different from the genes in your nerve cells. It are the same genes, but they are in another state of activity. We now know that 90% of genome is regulation, is organization, and defines the activity of your genome. And who is, so to say, regulate, regulating the different activity in my embryoblast cells and a different activity in my trophoblast cells that are not the genes. Genes are like brains, passive mechanism. They cannot do anything. A virus cannot do anything. A virus does not multiply itself. It cannot multiply. It cannot grow. It's a passive strength. It needs an organism. It needs a cell, and it will force the cell to make more copies of it. And the same thing happens here. The DNA, the genes are passive, but the genes in the embryoblast come in another state of activity. And from now on, when the cells divide, when the cells multiply, you get more embryoblast cells. And in the trophoblast cells, the opposite happened. There you see that the genome is transferred and becomes in a state of activity that is related to trophoblast cells. So what happens, the differentiation does not come from inside, from the genes to the outside. Your genotype is not causing your phenotype, no. Your body, your organism, so to say, orchestrates the activity of the genome. Differentiation comes from outside to inside. Again, the answer is not the genes are causing the differences that create a body that has all kinds of cells and organs. No, the organism, organism orchestrates the genes. And that's the modern word we now use for genes. And now we talk about the epigenome. We talk about factors that can influence the state of activity of the genome, but that is our factors that are produced and organized by the organism. So differentiation goes again from outside to inside, not from inside to outside. Like your body is not produced by your parts and your cells, but your body is an, entelegy, is an entity that orchestrates, organizes the cells and the organs. That's the main message that an embryo has to give you in these days of corona. Because 
the corona is a piece of DNA and it cannot cause a disease. But when the coronavirus comes in a human being, then it forces the cells, it forces the tissue to make copies of that virus and then the cells are destructed. So again, you know, the disease is phenotyped, if not caused by the genome, caused by the virus, but it's the reaction of the human body on that virus input. So that's maybe, um, I have told you now, we have two minutes left or whatever. I told you quite a different story that I, than the story that I had in my mind. I had another story in my mind. I wanted to talk with you about oneness and the parts. And now you see maybe what I was looking for to tell you that oneness, that togetherness, that wholeness is not a product of the part. And that is why you see so different reactions on the coronavirus in different countries, in different populations, because the many, the cells, the particles, the individuals, they create communities, they create nations, they are one we British, we Dutch, and they Americans. But what can happen? There are two ways to be one. There are two ways to be one. And the first way is the way the matter, the particles. All the particles the same, and you get a piece of iron. I mean, that is, I wrote it down. I, I made the last slide here. Yeah. You can be one in two ways. This is the first way. And Apparently, in, uh, and, uh, many years ago, you had dollars and you had uh, uh, the euro. And on the side of the euro, there was written in pluribus unum. And on the side of the dollar, there was written a pluribus unum. Pluribus, pluribus means the manyness, the, the, different, the differences. Out of the difference, you can come to one. Or you can be one in difference. And that's a political issue. That's a social issue. Can we, can we realize unity by making everybody the same? That's a principle. That's what the virus also brings us to, to become the same. Everybody the same rules, everybody the same way. But that is a pluribus, you come to the one. But in living organisms, you see something else. There you see that the one, the organism, the population can create a oneness, not because of the cells, but a oneness in the cells, and then you live in pluribus unum. Maybe I have gone too fast, but this is one of the lessons I learned from the embryo. I wish you a good night. I hope it was not too much and too fast, and I cannot thank you for your listening, because I do not hear you listen, I do not see you listening, but I hope you listened and that you liked it. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank Tracy. you, Kat. We, uh, we have lots of thank yous coming through, lots of excellence. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have over 650 people listening at the moment. So thank you so much for your thought provoking talk. It was wonderful. Um, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing. That's it. We have a, an exit poll if for those of you that wouldn't mind giving us some feedback on the webinar. And um, that would be very useful for us. Um, I just want to share a, a brief screen with you here. As um, Dr. Van der Waal said, he does have um, a, a seminar happening with us in September. It's called The Embryo in Us, and that is 22nd to 25th of September. There are details on the screen now that will direct you to our website where you can find out more information about that. Um, yeah, that was just so wonderful. I thank you so very, very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you this evening. Mm -hmm. And um, for everybody out there, please take care of yourselves during this time. And we wish you all very well. We will have some more webinars coming up. Please check our website and we'll be sending out some information about that. Thank you, everybody. We hope you have enjoyed it. Bless you all. Good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>